People love a good drama, and even in the paleontological community, historically anyway, there have been a series of rivalries, and none are more legendary than the feud between Othniel Charles Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope. Two brilliant paleontologists in their own right, the pair would develop a personal distaste for each other that would result in the legendary Bone Wars. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Prehistory in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons and our channel members from our sister channel over at History in the Dark. You are the reason why this content remains just at war. And today, we are going to discuss the Great Dinosaur Rush, also known as the Bone Wars. As stated, this war, as it's sometimes called, stemmed from the rivalry between Othniel Charles Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope. The pair of them were both paleontologists in the 1800s. During the earliest days of fossil recovery and the discovery and identification of what we call dinosaurs, as well as other prehistoric creatures. And at first, they actually were all right. They were very amicable between each other. They first met in Berlin in 1864, and actually spent several days together going over findings and research and just talking. It seemed like they could become friends and even named a handful of species after each other. But over time, their relationship soured, and part of that seemed to stem from their conflicting personalities. Cope was described as rather quarrelsome. He liked a good debate, but he also had a really quick temper, making him come off as kind of a jerk. He also tended to rush findings, eager to make a name for himself. Marsh was a lot slower, but more methodical and very introverted. He didn't like to get into verbal arguments over stuff. He just liked the science and publishing papers, well-researched and verified papers. They were also both incredibly distrustful of the people around them, so their conflicting personalities also made that worse. They also disagreed when it came to scientific theory. Cope was a very firm supporter of Neo-Lamarckism, which is a concept that an organism can pass on to its offspring physical characteristics that the parent organism acquired through use or disuse during its lifetime. Like, say, for example, you're the child of two bodybuilders. Therefore, you would inherit your parents' strong, muscular form. Marsh, on the other hand, supported Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. And on top of that, they came from extremely different backgrounds. Cope was born wealthy, the son of an influential Quaker family based in Philadelphia. And his dad had actually wanted him to work as a farmer, but Cope had distinguished himself as a naturalist. In 1864, he was already a member of the Academy of Natural Sciences and became the professor of zoology at Haverford College, joining Ferdinand Hayden on his expeditions west. Marsh actually was born into a very poor family, struggling in Lockport, New York, but he was lucky as he did have a very wealthy uncle who served as his benefactor, philanthropist George Peabody. Marsh was the one who persuaded his uncle to build the Peabody Museum of Natural History, and his uncle placed Marsh as head of the museum. This was, of course, after his uncle funded Marsh's education. Without his uncle, Marsh would not have been able to accomplish what he had, whereas Cope pretty much had money from the get-go. He wound up becoming financially comfortable and received a decent inheritance upon his uncle's death in 1869. The relationship started really souring when they went on fossil collecting expeditions to Cope's Marl Pits in New Jersey. That's where William Parker Falk had discovered the holotype specimen of Hadrosaurus Falki, which was described by paleontologist Joseph Leidy, who Cope had actually studied under researching comparative anatomy. This was actually one of the first American dinosaur finds, and the pits were still rich with fossils at the time. So, this was a big deal. And though the two were both there, and parted amicably, Marsh had secretly bribed the operators of the pit to divert future fossil finds to him, not Cope. And the two began attacking each other in papers and publications, dismissing each other's findings, and pointing holes in the other one's theories. As a result, their personal relationship deteriorated very quickly, 
and Marsh actually humiliated Cope by pointing out that his reconstruction of the plesiosaur, Elasmosaurus, was actually flawed. Cope had put the head of the animal on the tail, thinking that its neck was actually the tail. Now, in Marsh's defense, he was right. Cope had screwed this up, but he embarrassed him publicly by pointing this out. Instead of just, you know, coming to him and saying, hey, that's wrong. Although it's worth mentioning, Lydie was actually the one who published the correction. Cope, furious, began collecting in an area that Marsh considered his private bone hunting turf in Kansas and Wyoming, which Marsh deeply despised. And as a result, the bone wars were on. Into the 1870s, both of their attentions were directed to the American West. Because of word of very large fossil finds, Cope at the time had a significant influence in Washington, D.C., and was granted a position on the U.S. Geological Survey under Ferdinand Hayden. The position actually offered no salary, but Cope wasn't necessarily interested in that. It was a great opportunity to collect fossils in the West and therefore publish his findings. Hayden actually liked Cope quite a lot because Cope was a very dramatic writer and Hayden really wanted to make a popular impression with the official survey reports. He wanted people to be interested in what they were doing and Cope was very good at supplying scientific yet entertaining papers. Cope's first trip was in June of 1872 and during which he intended to observe the Eocene bone beds of Wyoming personally. But that caused a rift between Cope Hayden, and Lydie. Lydie had enjoyed receiving many of the fossils from Hayden's collection, but that ceased when Cope joined the survey, and Cope was hunting for fossils in Lydie's stake territory. At the same time, Lydie was supposed to be collecting. Hayden tried to smooth things over, but it didn't really help very much. Cope actually took his family with him as far as Denver, Colorado, and Hayden, to avoid further complications, tried to keep him and Lydie from prospecting in the same areas at the same time. Cope, upon receiving a tip from geologist fielding Bradford Meek, also wanted to investigate reports of bones that had been found near Black Butte Station, and the railroad for that matter. Cope actually did find some remains of a dinosaur that he called Agathomus sylvestris, which turned out to be a dubious genus of large ceratopsid. It's believed now that it was probably just a Triceratops. He believed he had the full support of Hayden and the survey, so he then traveled to Fort Bridger in June, only to find that the men, wagons, horses, and equipment he had expected to be there weren't actually there at all. He had to cobble together an outfit at his own expense that consisted of two teamsters, a cook, and a guide, along with three men from Chicago who were interested in studying with him. But as it turned out, two of Cope's men were in fact in the employ of Marsh. Marsh did not actually send them to spy on Cope, though. He did not know that they had taken money from him, and when he found out, he was livid. The men tried to assure Marsh that they were still working for him, and one even suggested that he took the job in order to lean Cope away from good fossils, but Marsh was known to be a little lackadaisical when it came to soliciting firm agreements with people, as well as actually paying people. He was really inconsistent about that, and that may have caused the men to seek other work. Cope was way more reliable in terms of actually paying workers on time, and the expedition took them through rugged country that only Hayden had previously surveyed, and as a result, he discovered dozens of new species. Additionally, while working for both of them, one of Marsh's men accidentally forwarded some of his material to Cope. Though to his credit, Cope did send them back to Marsh once he realized that this was an error, but this did not help improve the two's relationship. Any outward friendliness totally halted in 1872. An open hostility, full tilt, shots fired, began in spring of 1873. Lydie, Cope, and Marsh were all making great discoveries of ancient reptiles and mammals in the western bone beds, and they all had a habit of making very hasty telegrams eastward describing their finds, and only published fuller accounts after returning from trips. This resulted in a lot of overlap, as well as species that it turned out weren't separate species. Untotherium, for example, at one point was thought to be three separate species, we now know it's all the same one. 
Many of the finds just weren't uniquely different from each other. Cope and Marsh actually knew that some of the fossils they were collecting had already been found by the other one. And Marsh had a bit of a lead on Cope when it came to finding the fossils. Many of Marsh's names wound up becoming valid, while pretty much none of Cope's were. And the whole thing further humiliated Cope, and there was really nothing he could do to stop him. So instead, he published a broad analytical study where he proposed a new plan of classification for the Eocene mammals. In the paper, he discarded Marsh's genera in favor of his own. In spite of this, Marsh remained stubborn in his position and continued to claim that all of Cope's names for Dinocerata were incorrect. They continued returning west for more fossils, and Marsh himself made his last trip backed by Yale University in 1873, with a large group of 13 students with him. For the rest of the Bone Wars, Marsh preferred to enlist the services of local collectors rather than making cross-country trips himself. And at that point, he actually had enough bones to study for years. He really didn't have to search for any more, but he wanted more to outdo his rivals. Cope also ramped up his operations to make sure he got as many fossils as possible. He grew tired of working under Hayden and found a paying job with the Army Corps of Engineers. But the problem with this position, it was very limiting. He had to tag along on surveys and couldn't use federal funds to go on his own. Marsh, on the other hand, could collect wherever he wanted, giving him a solid advantage. In the mid-1870s, he started looking into the Dakota Territory, where the discovery of gold in the Black Hills had increased Native American tensions with the United States. They weren't interested in gold. They were, of course, interested in fossils, as the Black Hills did have a lot of fossils. Marsh wanted them, but in order to get them, he had to become somewhat involved in Army Native American politics. In order to be allowed to prospect the area without any issues, he had to gain the support of Chief Red Cloud of the Sioux Tribe. And he did manage to pull this off. He promised Red Cloud payment for the fossils and told him that he would return to Washington, D.C. and lobby on their behalf about their improper treatment. And to his credit, he did keep his word. He lobbied the Interior Department and President Ulysses S. Grant on behalf of Red Cloud, and though historians point out that he had quite a bit to gain here, Grant was actually pretty unpopular as a president, so lobbying against him might have made Marsh look good to most people. And he was getting the fossils he wanted. Well, he still kept his word. So, you know, give him that. By 1875, both Cope and Marsh were financially strained at best, and they had to pause their collecting. And they had a ton of backlog in terms of fines that they had to go through, research, and catalog. But then, by 1877, things changed again because of further discoveries out west. That year, Marsh received a letter from Arthur Lakes, who was a school teacher in Golden, Colorado. Lakes reported that he had been hiking in the mountains near the town of Morrison, and that was when he and his friend, H.C. Beckwith, actually discovered massive bones that were embedded in the rock. Lakes thought the bones were apparently a vertebra and a humerus bone from some gigantic saurian. And while still awaiting Marsh's reply, Lakes actually dug up more colossal bones and sent them to New Haven. Marsh was slow to respond, and in the meantime, Lakes also sent a shipment of bones to cope. When Marsh did respond to Lakes, he paid the prospector $100, urging him to keep the finds a secret, though it was too late for that. When Marsh found out that Lakes had also corresponded with Cope, Marsh sent his field collector, Benjamin Mudge, to Morrison to secure Lakes' services for themselves and shut Cope out of it. Marsh would actually manage to publish a description of Lakes' discoveries in the American Journal of Science on July 1st. And before Cope could publish his own interpretation of the finds, Lakes actually wrote to him and told him that the bones he had sent should actually be shipped to Marsh which Cope did not like at all. A second letter arrived from the West, and this time it was directly to Cope. It came from a man named O.W. Lucas, who was a naturalist, who had been collecting plants near Cannon City, Colorado, when he found, well, some fossils. Cope received some samples from Lucas, and he concluded that the dinosaurs must be large herbivores, and noted that the specimen was larger than any other previously described, including Lake's discoveries. Upon hearing of this, Marsh instructed Mudge and a former student of his, Samuel Wendell Williston, to set up a quarry on his behalf near Cannon. But he later learned from Williston 
that Lucas was actually finding the best bones and refused to quit Cope to come work for him. Marsh then ordered Williston back to Morrison, where Marsh's small quarry actually collapsed and nearly killed his assistants. So that was, that was good, that was great. That would have dried up Marsh's bone supply from the West, if not for the fact that he got a third letter. During this time, the first transcontinental railroad was being built through middle of nowhere, Wyoming. And the letter came from two men that identified themselves as Harlow and Edwards, and they were workers on the Union Pacific Railroad. Their real names were William Harlow Reed and William Edwards Carlin. They claimed that they had found large numbers of fossils in Como Bluff, and told him that there were others in the area looking for such things, which Marsh took to mean cope. Wilson had just managed to get back to Kansas after the collapse of the Morrison Quarry had almost killed him, and was quickly dispatched to Como Bluff by Marsh, because Marsh just did not care. Williston sent Marsh a message confirming that there were indeed large quantities of bones and that it was Cope's men looking around the area. Marsh didn't want to make the same mistakes he had made with Lakes, so he quickly sent money to the two new bone hunters and urged them to send additional fossils. Williston actually struck a preliminary bargain with Carlin Reed, who had actually been unable to cash Marsh's check due to the fact that it was made out to their pseudonyms. To be fair, he didn't know their actual names, so I don't think he did that on purpose. But Carlin decided he wanted to head to New Haven to deal with Marsh directly face to face. Marsh did draw up a contract calling for a set monthly fee to the men with additional cash bonuses to Carlin and Reed, depending on the importance of the fines. Marsh also received the right to send his own superintendents to supervise the digging if needed and advised them to try to keep Cope out of the region. But the deal honestly wasn't any better than the preliminary deal that was offered by Williston. And though he did accept the deal, he and Reed both felt a little resentful of the whole affair, as they thought that Marsh had actually bullied them into accepting. But Marsh's investment in the area did pay off. Reed wound up sending carloads of bones by rail to Marsh throughout 1877, and he would wind up describing very famous dinosaurs, like Stegosaurus, Allosaurus, and Apatosaurus in December of that year, in that month's issue of the American Journal of Science. Though Marsh had tried to prevent Cope from knowing how rich the bone beds were in the area, word of the discoveries of course spread, and that was actually at least partly due to Carlin and Reed. They helped spread rumors. Remember, they were kind of annoyed with the deal they had with Marsh, and they leaked information to the Laramie Daily Sentinel, which then published an article about the finds in April 1878 that wound up exaggerating the price Marsh had paid for the bones, making people think they were worth way more than in all actuality. Marsh tried to cover the leak and learned from Williston that Carlin and Reed had actually been visited by a man ostensibly working for Cope by the name of Haynes. Cope had actually sent what were known as dinosaur rustlers, yes, really, to the area in an attempt to steal fossils from under Marsh's nose. And during the winter of 1878, Carlin had had enough of Marsh's inability to pay them on time, so he started working for Cope instead. Each summer, Cope and Marsh would continue using their personal wealth to fund expeditions, and then spent the winter publishing their discoveries. This went on and on until 1892, every year, constantly sniping at one another and throwing accusations of spying, stealing workers, fossils, and bribery. Some was true, some wasn't. They were so protective of their digging sites that they would actually destroy smaller or damaged fossils to prevent them from falling into their rivals' hands. Which is just... No, don't ever... No... They would also fill their excavations with dirt and rock to make it harder for anyone else to dig in the area. And on at least one occasion, the scientists' rival teams actually got into a fight with each other, throwing stones. Yes, really. They were throwing rocks at each other. It was ridiculous. And of course, all the while, they were doing their best to ruin each other's professional credibility. Due to being humiliated by his error in reconstructing a Lasmosaurus, Cope actually tried to cover up his mistake by purchasing every copy he could of the journal in which it was published. What? <laughs> come on, man. That's, that's desperation if ever there was. Like, come on, what? But Marsh, meanwhile, made sure to publicize the story. 
And the problem was Cope was very, very fast at delivering his scientific papers, but that meant he frequently did make mistakes, and Marsh had no shortage of errors to be found within Cope's own research, which he, of course, used against him. Marsh wasn't infallible, of course. He did make some mistakes, but not as many as Cope did. And by the late 1880s, Marsh was placed the head of the Consolidated Government Survey by the head of the U.S. Geological Survey, John Wesley Powell. And to be honest, Marsh himself had grown tired of feuding with Cope. It was stressful, and he just didn't have time for it. This new role allowed him to continue his research, but be a bit more out of the public spotlight, since prior to that point, articles had sensationalized the feud between the two. But even there, interest was fading. People were tired of watching these two scientists throw mud at each other. It just wasn't entertaining anymore. Cope was actually a lot less well-off than Marsh was, as he spent most of his own money purchasing The American Naturalist, a monthly peer-reviewed scientific journal. And he had a hard time finding employment thanks to Marsh's allies in higher education, as well as his own personal temperament. Even before the war, he was already known to be kind of a jerk. He began investing what money he had left in gold and silver prospects out west, and he still searched for fossils himself on occasion. But he had a lack of support and his finances continued to deteriorate to the point that his fossil collection was actually his only significant asset left. Marsh also started alienating even his most loyal assistants, that included Williston, because Marsh refused to share his conclusions drawn from their findings, and he still, to his dying day, was just not good about paying his employees on time. Over the years, Cope had kept an elaborate journal of mistakes and misdeeds that Marsh and Powell had committed. Which is just... What? This man had a Dwarven Book of Grudges. Seriously, I'm not making this up. He stored it in the bottom drawer of his desk. And in newspaper articles he had published, he accused Marsh of plagiarism and financial mismanagement. And he attacked Powell for his geological classification errors and misspending of government allocated funds. Marsh and Powell were able to publish their own side of the story, and the articles that Cope had had published were poorly researched, written, and read, so little changed as a result of all of this. Though Powell would find himself the subject of larger scrutiny before the House Appropriations Committee. This was due to Marsh's perceived extravagance with survey funds, and the committee wanted the survey's budget to be itemized, so it would be very clear where the money was going. When his appropriation was cut off in 1892, Powell actually sent a telegram to Marsh demanding his resignation, which was a personal slight and a financial one. At the same time, his own extravagant lifestyle was catching up with him. Remember, he'd inherited most of his own money, and he'd spent a lot of it, well, feuding with Cope, not actually investing it or saving it. And at the same time, Cope received a position on the Texas Geological Survey. And at that point, Cope opted not to take advantage of that to press personal attacks, as he was still financially struggling, and he'd rather focus on actually working, rather than fighting with Marsh. Though their rivalry still continued, and Cope started financially struggling again, and received a slap in the face when Marsh regained a lot of his recognition by earning the Cuvier Medal, which was the highest paleontological award. The whole war wouldn't actually end until Cope finally died in 1897. And by that year, both men were financially ruined. Cope had suffered from a debilitating illness during his later years, and he had to sell part of his own fossil collection and rent out one of his houses to make ends meet. Marsh had had to mortgage his residence and ask Yale for a salary on which to live. Both were mentally exhausted towards the end of their lives, Though Cope did issue one final challenge before his death. He wound up having his skull donated to science so that his brain could be measured, hoping that his brain would be larger than Marsh's. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Though in his defense, at the time, it was thought that brain size was indeed an accurate measure of intelligence. It isn't, but at the time, that's what they honestly thought. And Marsh didn't actually accept this challenge. No one ever analyzed his brain. 
though Pope's skull is reportedly still preserved at the University of Pennsylvania. Though its authenticity is actually disputed, as the university thinks that the real skull may have been lost in the 1970s. Though Robert Baker said that the hairline fractures on the skull, and the coroner's reports verify its authenticity, so who's to say? Either way, if you judge by pure numbers of discoveries, Marsh won the Bone Wars, but was there really a winner here? Both men wound up financially destroyed, and it turns out its effect overall on the scientific community, well, it's mixed. There were some good things to come out of this ridiculous nonsense. For one thing, the level of discoveries was insane. There were a lot of dinosaurs and other ancient creatures discovered during this time, and the men were likely spurred to find as many as they could in order to outdo the other one. Competition can breed innovation in some aspects, and the war actually helped ignite public interest in dinosaurs. The drama between the two was good reading for the time. People were interested in that for entertainment. But as a result, people started recognizing dinosaurs as a thing and grew curious about them as well, in addition to these two scientists consistently fighting. But there were a lot of downsides to the whole thing too. The war actually harmed the reputation of American paleontology as a whole when it came to Europe for decades afterwards and the reported destruction of some fossil remains is largely frowned upon. Joseph Leidy also suffered as the third major individual involved in the wars. He wound up abandoning his more methodical excavations in the West, finding he just couldn't keep up with Cope and Marsh, who were speeding out of control to find as many as they could. Leidy was also exhausted of being trapped in the middle of their constant bickering, and he withdrew from the field for his own mental health, and that marginalized his own legacy after his death, because he was a brilliant researcher and paleontologist. On top of that, Henry Fairfield Osborne, who had been a friend of Cope's, found not a single mention of Lighty in either of the other men's works at all. And in their haste to outdo the other, Cope and Marsh quickly assembled bones of their own discoveries causing a lot of mistakes, and their fast and furious descriptions of new species, sometimes describing the same exact animal slightly differently, led to confusion and misconceptions that also lasted for decades after they both died. As you can tell, the whole thing was just nuts. But they both succeeded in going down in history, so I guess there's that. Till next time, this is Darkness, and a bit well a fond farewell.